Hey, I'm Ryan. Sorry I'm on the floor. I broke my tripod um, and I'm ordering a new one. I wanted to talk about something that I saw vaguely. I saw a comment on someone's video about the Y2K fashion era where they said that they miss the Y2K fashion and they love, they'll always cling to Y2K fashion and then they proceeded to describe bling era fashion like the mid 2000s. So they were describing like hot pink and denim. They were saying that um, they miss the Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan era. <laughs> haven't even stepped out of the damn bus. Lindsay Lohan, I think was like 14 years old when we switched from 1999 to 2000. She was not like a fashion girl or a fashion icon. I think Paris Hilton was like 19. They were both very young. And even though Paris Hilton had done some like editorial work and stuff, I, I know that that's not what they're talking about. They also referenced Snooki from Jersey Shore. They said, I love the Y2K Jersey Shore look. Jersey Shore came out in 2009 and I think ended in 2012. It is not at all associated with Y2K or like the late 90s transition into the early 2000s. Um, and what I think was happening there was a larger cultural phenomenon of something, some aspect of the nostalgia trap that I don't find that everybody's already addressed. So I wanted to talk about that today and hopefully it's interesting and I also am connecting it to Margiela, the Snooki to Margiela industrial complex. Like I'm gonna get us there and I hope you're cool with that. So let's take the ride, ready? Okay, so I feel like it's important to talk about subcultures. I think I'm gonna go into memory. We're gonna go into nostalgia in general broadly and how it connects to like media interpretations and um, how, our, how our relationships are built with like marketing, um, the structure of fashion um, as a system. And then we're tying it into Margiela with a bow. So that's just the little roadmap. Hopefully I can traverse it properly. It looks like 15 pages with 24 size font. So prayers up. Let's go. Okay. So I've shared the article from Vern Kenneth Baxter about youth subcultures and how black fashion is constructed within those contexts in schools from children who see what's going on in the mainstream, want to defy that, and feel a lot of pressure socially and culturally to adhere to what's going on in the mainstream and um, choose to or are encouraged culturally to divest from those standards, meaning Mainstream will say dress this way, adhere to these ideals of like preppiness and wealth and um, identity, your hair should look this way, your grooming practices should be like this. And you're deciding that those are made up and you don't have to subscribe to those and you want to cultivate identity differently or you're within a ethnic or cultural subgroup that values different culture than what's going on in the mainstream and you're subscribing to those instead in direct um, relationship with the mainstream you're not just randomly choosing to be different um, you're saying the mainstream is, doesn't work for you you're deviating from the constructed hegemonic enforcers um, and he also talks about how like in a stressful working class environment that experience will essentially instigate youth subcultures shaping themselves around like distinctive activities which create the fashion that's associated. So they're like, I don't want to go to school and I don't want to be like my mom and dad. I want to be different. I grew up in the suburbs, but I want to be different. I'm not like them. I'm not conventional. I'm not typical. And again, they're defying those um, mainstream ideals and um, they're not just doing that mentally or with their fashion, they're fashioning identities around what other activities they're choosing to participate in um, that reflect the fact that they don't agree with the mainstream. So whether that's skateboarding uh, culture or other outdoor sports cultures or other nightlife <laughs> cultures and things like that, um, it changes the way that people dress. I think we can all, we've all seen mid nineties, so. Um, okay. And then I think I would add to that because I think that was written kind of a while ago, but I would add to that that this also exists in online subcultures as well. I think that there are a lot of people who are pushed into uh, shaping and cultivating identity around things and themes that they're interacting with online on a daily basis because I'm chronically on Twitter and I'm like, this is where young people go to like find themselves in Tumblr and Pinterest and stuff like that. Like people find identity online as well, um, but these identities that they're finding online, again, I also think have a direct relationship with wanting to defy what's going on in the mainstream, not just for the purpose of cultivating identity, even though I do think Gen Z has a stronger emphasis on that, but like, I think they're doing it because they don't agree with what's going on in the mainstream. Obviously, politically and socially, we're 
we're in dark times, so it makes sense. Okay, but um, what I've also talked about is how there can be within a subculture internal status hierarchies, right? So internal status hierarchies mean inside of the subculture, you can be cooler than someone else. Like, sorry, like you would have more status than somebody else. And obviously status is relational. There has to be someone with high status and someone with low status in a two person or more group, right? Um, in an internal status hierarchy, you would find people who are adapting aspects of the subculture to assert more status and dominance. So like, let's say everybody is just, who's in this group is a skateboarder, meaning they're already a part of a subculture that is different than the mainstream. They're all skateboarders, but there's a coolest skateboarder in the skateboarder group. It's like those um, videos on TikTok. Have you ever seen the videos on TikTok? They're like, who is the leader of your friend group? You know, like who's the alpha, who's the leader of the friend group? That would be the person with the most status within that internal status hierarchy. It's from Rockton and it says that culture is a heteroglossia with clashing ideals and conventions coexisting in a dialogic struggle. Meaning when someone's getting dressed within a subculture, it's not like you can ever be in a subculture that is isolated from the rest of the context of reality. Like Snooki's aesthetic exists, but it also exists in relationship with like how we see class and like stereotyping um, how we see race and ethnicity and how we have historically, but also how we see race, but also how we see identities within the construct of race, like her proximity to her distance from it, et cetera, et cetera. Like all of these things are connected and work together to build her conflicting identity, just like mine and just like yours. All of these things work together to construct the identity and create meaning for us. And they all exist with in conflict with each other. And they exist relationally to larger uh, cultural understanding. So they're never totalizing, they're always dynamic. And I think that the way that this relates to sleaze and like the emphasis people have on more extreme and like fringe aesthetics in fashion and why people love Snooki's fashion and the Paris Hilton nightlife and the Lindsay Lohan nightlife is because of their relationship with nostalgia. It's provocative and disruptive and you can kind of see that and you want and long for the ability to cling to those not just aesthetics, but like larger like purposes, I think, especially with how um, how much ambiguity we feel and unease about the uncertainty of the present, but especially the future right now. You want to cling to somebody who is like, I'm sure that I feel this way. I am sure that I'm defying, you know, the structures at this time. Um, and you're like, I miss that. I miss when people felt strong in their identities because it seems like people feel strong in their identities in the past. Like, I love the Y2K, blah, 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 blah. But Y2K, the whole point of Y2K was the sense of uncertainty, the, the confusion and fear of what would happen when we switched from 1999 to 2000. Would the banks all crash? Would all of the clocks just explode? Like, what was going to happen? Um, and to cling to this and long for this non-existent memory, like you could not have lived through the 2000s if you think or like you, I don't say you couldn't have lived through, but you probably didn't, weren't born or weren't coherent in 1999 or 2000 if you associate Snooki with that time period. So like they're longing for this imagined past that didn't ever actually happen and possibly, and like wasn't ever, um, like it wasn't a positive reality for Snooki to look or dress that way, but they long for the concept of like having such assured, uh, distinct identity. And I think that that's like how it's tied to memory. Like, I've said this before, Snooki, the flavor of love girls, the rock of love girls, the Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan, I cannot explain in language how difficult a time that they had socially in the media. I cannot explain, like, I, there's no social media platform that wouldn't ban me for, if I explained how terribly people talked about them, like, across all axes. They said horrible things about their bodies, their appearances. There were games online to make fun of Lindsay Lohan's body that, like, web developers created so that people could play games to, like, disrespect how they perceived her body. Like, the, the, the most disgusting things were talked about um, as far as these young women. The same with Snooki, the same with the Rock of Love girls. They were all made fun of. They were memes, like, before meme culture was what it is now. Like. If you said you look like somebody on Flavor of Love, it was not a compliment. It was like the very opposite. They were seen as the lowest people in society, the lowest common denominators. There wasn't this feminist discourse that's really popular right now since the 2010s. Like people did not speak that way <laughs> at all at that time. Like it was horrible for those girls and for people to remember it or have this longing for these false memories. Like, oh, I wish I could have dressed like that or having comfort in dressing like that. and. Um, in the present, when there are different consequences for dressing that way, I think it comes from like our perceptions of memory and nostalgia as they relate to um, fashion. Okay, 
I cited CJ Babala's dissertation on memory before. I'm going to quote it. Um, in the, the dissertation, there's a quote that says things are important because they carry cultural meaning. Grant McCracken says that the fashion system is an instrument of meaning movement. And then Coda says that a clothing item can become fetishized so it holds the potency of the original period. My perspective is that I think clothes act as symbols for times that are surrounded with ambiguity and they carry potency of the rose-colored glasses perspectives that people have on the past. Does that make sense? Like, they do have potency of the original period, but they also have like misrepresentations of the original period which is why I think people cling to them. I think it's important to people that they don't know exactly what happened in the 2000s to the 2010s, right? That's why people love the Snooki era fashion, that's why people love the Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan nightlife era fashion because they either weren't coherent or don't understand the impact of it or want to ignore the impact of it, that these women were treated horribly by the media and all of the press and all of the public and that their, their names were synonymous with like being a bad, lowly person, an inferior woman, like trashy, disgusting, like their names meant bad things. There was so much slander and like um, conspiracy and controversy, as British people say, around these people's identities. And I think people like that they're like, well, now that we're not there, I get to take this artifact from the past and give it new life and new meaning while pretend, like, feigning, um, you know, some feigning longing for the past. Like, I love that era. It's like, you don't love the era. I don't even say you like the fashion because fashion has a direct relationship with, like, meaning and how it was impacted culturally. I think you like, like, the fact that you can... I don't know, like decontextualize it from all that meaning. Marilyn Horne says to discard the old is risking possible evils and misfortunes possibly accompanying the new and improving. And I think that that's kind of like the basis of this whole concept to me. Like if we're attacking what's going on right now, and I said this on live the other day, if we have to interpret what's happening right now in our reality, it's not the best and we know that and we know all of the different nuances and differences and subtleties between why it's not the best. The, the example that I always give for some reason is like e-boys and e-girls. If in 20 years they look back and then they represent this time period with e-boys and e-girls, are there e-boys and e-girls? Sure, absolutely. Do we see them positively? Do we see them favorably? Have we ever? In my opinion, no. Like people have always made fun of them. So it wouldn't be an accurate representation of them, right? Um, and we know that and we know how complicated it is and how difficult it is to shape and cultivate identity right now without being seen as like corny or having your authenticity checked or like if you post a picture online people will be like that outfit sucks even if you felt great about it or confident in it like and we know all of those like stressful differences and when you go to the past you don't really know exactly even if you did live through some time periods sometimes you don't know or can't communicate exactly through fashion what the mistakes would be or like what wouldn't be interpreted positively and that's a sign of like sureness like you're like this is my freedom of expression that i like you were three years old in 2003 so you're like slay i can dress like it's 2003 again because i don't know if this would be a dork or a dweeb in 2003 or the coolest most stylish girl ever in 2003 and most people now wouldn't necessarily either because we update our codes and um like interpreting what's in and what's out like as we go like we for most people, galaxy leggings are not cool right now, or whatever. <clears throat> but do you think 50 years in the past, they're going to know galaxy leggings stopped being cool in 2013 or whatever year versus 2019? No, they're not going to know. They're going to be like, yeah, that was the 2010s look. So they're going to they're gonna categorize, categorize it all together, you know what I mean? They're not going to know about those distinctions, and they're not going to care, and they're not going to feel the pressure of it. They're going to feel certainty that, like, I'm interpreting a time of the past. None of us really know what was in or out at what point, or what the cool Galaxy Leggings brands were or weren't, or what the subtleties of how to wear Galaxy Leggings were or weren't correctly. And that's, a, that's like, a place of freedom for people. Um, and you know, like what's going on now, like you know all the stressful trends, like what's in and what's out, what do you have to get rid of at the end of the season so that people don't think you're a dork dweeb loser from the past season or trend follower and people don't interpret you negatively, you're like, in order to divest from all the stress of that, let me just wear something from way back when. And I think that that's like where the meaning is, that you know that there was meaning there, but you know, you don't have to take it on anymore. Um, objects, meanings, transfer to consumer and it affirms and evokes and assigns and revises the symbols and the meanings. Yeah, that's like, I think the summation of that. Um, and then in, I think Ingrid Loschuk's book, she talks about how Mark by Mark Jacobs, 
uh, spring 2003 allowed women to wear uniforms and I connected this to like the Miu Miu, like tie trend, Prada tie trend, all of the um, like schoolgirl looking clothes and um, loafers and uniform looking aesthetics, ballet core even to me, this ties into this idea of like reclaiming your youth, fantasizing about being able to do it right and do it over. Um, and perfecting that experience through the way that you fashion an identity using nostalgia. So you're not a child, but you're embracing that aesthetic because you long for that different reality. You may not have even done ballet like when you were growing up, or maybe you did it when you were three to four years old, and then you stopped doing it forever, but you're like, yeah, I'm gonna embrace my ballet aesthetic. You can't be a ballerina, you've never been a ballerina, you have no plans to be a ballerina, but you like that it's like, oh, this is like what we all used to do when we were little. And maybe you had a terrible time in ballet, but you're reclaiming that now. You're not going to embrace all of the distinctions and specificities of that time and say like, when I wore the ballet skirt, everybody looked at me and I felt bad about my body. You're not going to embrace that. You're going to have rose-colored glasses and see this uh, area of nostalgia positively. Maybe you had a terrible time in primary school or any other time in school when you had to wear a uniform. Do you think you have to embrace that when you get dressed? Of course not. And I think that that's like one of the benefits of nostalgia. And I think that that's why push people push towards these subcultural like fringe aesthetics and sleeves because it's like this ultimate freedom of like going back into the past and not having to embrace the reality of the past. Um, which is why nostalgia is like a pathology <laughs> but also like doing it in a way where people had major consequences and being like and i absolutely refuse to take on those consequences there aren't the same consequences for me you know what i mean because i'm not dressed in a way that's like quote unquote trashy as much as i am dressed in a way that is from the past like that's how people pri like organize it in their minds primarily you look like someone from the early 2000s and then maybe you are or aren't trashy or whatever but you're effectively communicating an era based fashion trend and that's how people think about it i think that that's like where people find the freedom consumer culture became a site for processing spatial temporal spatial temporal longings potentially associated with the production of false memories and so like at some point in marketing they've realized they can capitalize on making people feel like they remember a time of the past um even if they don't i saw this girl on tiktok and she was saying um like i miss you steve from blues clues and i was like there's no way someone who's 17 years old misses steve from blues clues because steve left, Bl left blues clues before 17 years ago. Like, you never grew up with Steve from Blue's Clues. You were watching reruns of Steve from Blue's Clues, but you also would have had to see, you would have had to have seen at the time the next host live. Like, because those episodes were being shown at that time. So you had to have always had both Steve and then the next host after Steve. So you're longing for a period that you didn't experience. Like, I miss Steve, or like, not to say that you can't miss Steve, but I think, I forgot how she worded it. She was saying, like, I don't know, whatever she worded it as was like as if she, Steve was from her era of like growing up. Steve was from my era from like the 1900s, like 1901, just joking. Like, she's like longing for an experience she didn't have. Like, you can't absolutely grow up with the other host of Blue's Clues. This is a stupid breakdown. Like, you absolutely can grow up with the, um, the host of Blue's Clues, fun reruns, and like appreciate that you grew up seeing him and then know that at, at a period it transitioned to being mostly only episodes of the newer host, but it doesn't mean that it's your past to remember if you're always watching reruns. It would be like, I was like, I sure do miss like Sanford and Son. It's like, blah, 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 blah. And then Frederick Jameson says that within the development of global capitalism, cultural production, and originality and innovation eventually come become obsolete um, and you like have this like obsession with the retro and like reinventing the past and also like these simulacrums where you're reinventing interpretations of the past that aren't actually real and they feel like AI generated interpretations of the past and there is no actual source and there is no actual past <laughs> um, but yeah like it makes it so that people are always looking back toward these the past and also these imaginations of the past to construct like new nostalgia where people who were born in 2000 or later are creating 1990s graphic design um, on Twitter and that's like the biggest form of creating art. People who are 17, 18, and 19 years old are like I love this aesthetic blah 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 and they're the creators of this aesthetic that they literally did not grow up with and are only seeing from a perspective of investigating the past and now they're the like arbiters of this and I think that that's so interesting um and then the next source Hike says that retro is like a pillaging of the past leading to pastiche simulacrum which is what I was saying like essentially there is no source and you're just imitating the imitation of the imitation and then that becomes the source even though that's not an actual source and there is no 
like where to lead back to because it's just the imaginations of people who never actually experienced it in the first place constructing an idea of what it's like so when people see 20 years from now 2020s edits of 1990s um like graphic design and <laughs> like catalog images it's gonna be so crazy because the thing is they're gonna pull from that picture of that girl on twitter who is always used in those playstation 2 vintage ads pictures and it's not a vintage ad she made that ad in like 2020 but people are going to be like this is a vintage playstation ad even though it's from 2020 and she was referencing the aesthetic of the vintage playstation ads and they're going to reference that even though it's not real and there is no source and it's not from the 90s it's just going to be so like out of control um so then jameson says that stylized presentations of the presence will exist and be created as if it has already slips away which underlines the inherent ephemerality of the present which is what i connect back to margella which i'm not gonna talk about now but like i do feel like that's essentially the grab like you're always making it seem like the past is just such a beautiful time and also like the present oh we can't even hold on to it because it's just here one day and gone the next and so you're never actually embracing reality um and your entire relationship with the present when you are constantly focused on nostalgia is like time keeps slipping away from me yeah i need to insert the casey and jojo video because it's so funny but like literally that you're like damn it's, it's already passed and it's like you you never had time to like stay in and like live in and appreciate what's actually going on now i noticed this a couple years ago when everybody was like obsessed with like re-watching their favorite shows from the 90s and cartoons and all of the channels started like airing old cartoons and old tv shows um if you actually investigate your nostalgia you will realize what nostalgia is which is like fully rose-colored glasses i tried watching the cartoons from the 90s and i tried it the other day too i almost had um a panic attack because they're so overwhelming and colorful and loud and annoying and there's just too much going on and I guess it's to stimulate the mind of a child but my brain is like turn it tone it down it is so annoying to watch especially back to back to back these 15 or 12 minute videos like watching two hours of that will make you like go insane it feels like your brain is spiking like this and it's not that beautiful or amazing it probably wasn't that these were the best shows ever created or that they were so genius it was just that I was little and that was slaying because I didn't have bills to pay you know but your mind makes you think like this was the best show ever created this show served every purpose it taught you so much and you watch it back and you'll be like i don't even agree with that or i do and i definitely didn't pick up on that when i was little you know <laughs> but it makes you think you know that you did at the time so you're um you're at that point in embracing the ersatz nostalgia so like the imagined nostalgia that he describes and it's creating a feeling of longing for a conceived past essentially rather than allowing an opportunity to tap into and embrace your own lived experience um he says that it creates a simulacra of periods that constitute the flow of time conceived as long distant absent feeding back into the consumption of commodities and this is how i think it connects to like the i miss the y2k i miss the mini skirts in the pink i miss the snooky the Paris Hilton, the Lindsay Lohan. They use nostalgia in marketing and capitalize on creating this feeling of longing for a past you never actually experienced and not ever being centered in the presence constantly to sell you commodities. And so that is how your brain is rewired. Your brain is obsessed with using commodities to satisfy the un lack of resolve that you have about the present and your desire to um, romanticize the past and so that's how you shop and that's how you live and that's how you experience reality essentially in direct relationship with marketing it makes people feel like they have to consume around that form of marketing but like live around that form of marketing satisfying that by buying things you know and shopping your way out of it and when you shop your way out of it you're shopping your way into certainty hello nostalgia slays like I have said like 70,000 times, I dressed like Estero in the early 2000s and I also dressed like a mom in the early 2000s. Think about how settling it is and how calming it is to not have to embrace the reality of like having to pay bills, having to live in New York City, housing crisis, uh, romance and love, friendships and chaos, politics and all this other stuff. That was the best time in my life ever, the early 2000s. I didn't have a job, I didn't have bills. I was taken care of by both parents we had a house we had all these things that like are sure because it already happened it wasn't a perfect time right and that's not even my reality because i'm not dressing like my mom 
I'm not even dressing like how my mom dressed. It's not even my reality. But I am longing for this uh, imagined past that I didn't even necessarily experience. I didn't dress like Estero when I was a little kid. My mom didn't dress like Estero when she was a little, when I was a little kid. She didn't play Estero's music. I found Estero's music when I was independently researching on the internet in like second or third grade. Like, it has nothing to do with my actual lived experience, but I'm reconstructing an experience in the past and clinging to it and then embracing it now so that this is the only certainty that I have essentially. I have certainty in my life. My life is stable. But you know what I mean? Like this is one area of assured certainty that I have by doing that. By having red hair, by dressing like it's the 90s or early 2000s, like just the red hair alone secure, secures me. It doesn't matter how trends change. It doesn't matter if people think I'm beautiful or not. It doesn't matter if people think I'm on trend or in or out. I'm like, well, I don't need to be because I'm from the past. There's nothing you can do to change about the fact that this was a thing in the past and that gives me certainty. It's like I'm running from the present. Because if I have to embrace the present, what if this hairstyle goes out of style? What if the hair color goes out of style? What if, you know, blah, 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 blah. I don't need it. I'm running away from it into the past. That's what I think that is um, anchoring about this experience. Whatever's missing in your life, I wrote, in the present is what creates the longing. And they exist alongside. This is what I was trying to say. I didn't know I wrote it so soon. So I wrote, whatever's missing in your life in the present is what creates the longing and it exists alongside your imaginations of the past, thus creating this satisfying reality where you long and then are fulfilled by false memories. Long, fulfilled by false memories, and they, they exist parallel to each other. Uh, da, 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 da. So like I said earlier, the, the idea that um, this is connected to marketing is from Arjun Apadurai in 1996, who says that marketing and merchandising simulate nostalgic feeling and experiences of loss that hasn't actually even taken place. So you're like, oh, I'm without oh my gosh like that's why it's nostalgia like that's why it's a pathology oh i'm without it didn't happen like you never had something in the first place you never lost it but your mind replicates the feeling of having lost and longing and remembering the longing um and this is what i said <laughs> i tried to explain it i said for example people saying that they missed the blues clues host that they never saw live on tv it's not that they were saying that they miss him they were saying something like I'm so glad you're back, or like it was so hard to not be with you, like on TV, but like you always had both. If you were born, if you're 17 years old in 2021, you've always had both. You've never only had one host of Blue's Clues. This is the Blue's Clues industrial complex, babe. Like the Snooky to the Blue's Clues brings us to Margiela. You'll see me, you'll see me get there. Okay. And Simon Reynolds is the one who identifies this as like retromania, and I think this speaks to the larger phenomenon in like marketing culture, not just like in people's minds. <laughs> um, and Ingrid Loschuk says, like, even outside of this context, that your brain produces external realities and provides external constructs of reality. So you have this imaginary crossover of time and place. It talks about how Tavi Gevinson um, at Rookie Mag, like, Rookie was all about nostalgia. Like, just the concept of the Rookie Yearbook and just, like, how everything that we did... I don't know how to explain it, just like contributed to this idea of like false nostalgia and false longing of like literally like 14 to like 19 year olds. <laughs> like it was fully that kind of trap um, where it was like you were in the, I don't know if you can say this movie, the sides, like you're in the past, but you're in the suburbs in this area and it's like this and it's hot outside. Like none of those things happen. Like you're not actually remembering that, but you like the longing for the idea that this is what it was like, that this was like idyllic time in the 70s and we know as feminists like the whole point of rookie mag was that it's like a feminist like anti-racist publication we know the 70s were not a good time and that people had to do a lot to fight against a lot of horrible things and like we would never want to have been born any earlier than we were realistically um not that we wouldn't do the same fighting but like you know like you know who wants to have less rights than they do so it was just an interesting way of like uh, this cross temporal experience um okay so i broadly connected this my theory. I broadly connected this because I'm a, a kid of the internet and I'm realizing like from an evolutionary standpoint we have never had, as far as I know, honey, I don't know how many realities there are, but we've never had the internet and there we can't really study or measure the impact it has on our minds. So I broadly connect this to displacement mentally as a result of the internet and in general because of globalization. When you're always interacting with these concepts online people find themselves less grounded. They find security and nostalgia because the internet doesn't center people it mentally displaces us and I think the same thing could be said about like constantly engaging like movies and television even before people were as like hooked to the internet as they are none of these places in our mind that we're engaging on the internet all day are real like when you text your friends that's not a place but your head is there your brain is mentally there you are thinking about something that isn't a physical space that you've ever been in 
when you're on Twitter, you can't go to Twitter. We went to Twitter together. I grew up on Twitter. You know what I mean? Like you can't ever go to Twitter and your brain just stays there and creates meaning around these symbols that it sees all day and the timing. I'm going to make a separate video about like internet interactions and timing and how frequent someone tweets or how frequently somebody uploads or, you know, all those different things and how we categorize those things and have perceptions of different people. Like someone who tweets a lot, we don't see as favorably as somebody who only tweets like really infrequently or like, they're here. Oh my God, I hope they notice me. You know what I mean? Someone who likes everyone's tweets versus someone who only likes selective tweets, replies to everyone's tweets versus replies to selective tweets, puts you in the close friends, doesn't put you in the close friends for different things or whatever. Like how we construct meaning around those things. These are not real like places. You cannot hold being in the close friends. You cannot go to being in someone's close friends, but your brain is creating meaning around those symbols. And I'm, my theory is that like, it's really displacing. I think your brain is like, we need something to cling to. Like what the hell is happening? We need something physical to cling to and also like think about how personal it is to dress yourself with physical objects to symbolize like security in something you know what I mean like think about a security blanket so in order to create order my theory I'm positing is your brain longs for the imagined past which you can control and use to fulfill your desires presently that are created by the present displacement and disorder and chaotic unfulfilling reality um, it's like unprecedented the time that we spend in our heads in these places that are never like they're not real like if you're like in your head in the 1950s about I mean they had TV then but like you know what I mean if you're in your head in your 50s about like a great time that you had on a Saturday night like you did go to that place on a Saturday night and you possibly can go back to that place but you cannot ever go to Twitter you cannot ever go to MySpace I'm like how does our brain reconcile that you spend like your childhood on MySpace and then MySpace is taken from us and you can never go to MySpace I have never went to Uvu Jabber, but you know what I mean? Like, you can never go to MySpace, you've never been to MySpace. <laughs> it sounds like I'm reading somebody, but you know what I mean? But your, but your brain was there. <coughs> you go to Tumblr for years after that, but your brain, feel it feels like it's on Tumblr, quote unquote, but you're not anywhere. You're just looking at a screen, you know what I mean? And I feel like that creates a lot of unresolved, lack of resolve, I need to say. Um, Especially when you're seeing all these aspirational images and aspirational things that create like uncertainty and then you have to deal with the real chaotic world and go into work. I think the brain is working to reconcile that through nostalgia and I think that that's why the brain likes these extreme fringe aesthetics especially because it's like the ultimate assertion of um, certainty. What's more certain than Snooki? When you look at Snooki, she knows exactly who she is, it's seemingly. Uh, compared to having to embrace like which niche micro aesthetic is in or out this week is the house of sunny dress allowed to be worn or am I canceled what brands are in or out or canceled what brand brands are problematic what brands are sustainable am I doing the right or wrong thing does anyone care why isn't anybody noticing me like all those feelings they're not grounding or centering and they don't create peace for us in our constructed selves in the ways that nostalgia can especially when it's through rose-colored glasses that are not real you know um next okay Loshik says that fashion is explained from the perspective of sensory perception theoretical recognition of social constructs so when we're looking at fashion in the first place like as we're interpreting it you're like what but then you're like how you know what I mean so your brain, she says, is doing this cerebral synthesized processing. So the way that we interpret fashion, like I said before, is relational in the first place. So we're always creating meaning out of it. And so I think that, again, that's why the past is really grounding. But also that's why people with these extreme aesthetics, like Paris Hilton's like nightlife aesthetic, was controversial at the time because it's like, who, who are you to feel confident being so bold in wearing these like extreme fringe aesthetics? But also like some of the, the things were like um, the, the like, what people consider think of as Y2K but it's like the bling era like these were also black aesthetics and that's like an extreme subculture or used to be an extreme subculture because of the um, massive distinctions that we had socially and culturally where like people didn't want to look or dress the way that Americans did and so for people to tap into those aesthetics that's why I also think like American fashion from the early 2000s and mid 2000s and even the actual like crossover into the year 2000 Y2K I think that's also why people cling to it because these were really assured like really defiant strong aesthetics compared to mainstream America especially like suburban or small America it's like ooh, how dare you defy what's going on in the mainstream with such intensity and fervor and like people are clinging to that because they're like whoa you felt really strong about that and certain about that and grounded in that identity 
and that challenging identity, and that's what that's what they want. And it's like it actually was horrible to look in the 90s and early 2000s, like it was horrible. They were trying to create laws against it. You certainly cannot not assimilate. So to like look back and be like, oh, these cool aesthetics, it's not just that they think that they're cool, but they see them as like this pure time of like asserting identity without the consequences of it. I don't think people dress in the ways that I'm gonna put on the screen. I don't think that they're wearing that and thinking about the complications of dressing like that back then. And even if they are, they know that those complications don't necessarily exist. Um, so Alexander McQueen and Hussein Shalane are examples of like how we interpret fashion, um, how do I say, like relationally, like because we understand the intellectual connotation of the work from those designers, which is um, what Ingrid Loeschek talks about, we elevate their work inherently. Like, and this is something that I love about contemporary art and art in general, like when you put a certain piece like if I put this sweater on the floor in a contemporary art space, people would be like, is that a is that an art piece? Like, who is the artist who does that? Nobody would think somebody dropped their sweater, they'd be like, what does it mean? Does it symbolize like is it like a Hussein Chalain piece about like having to get up and go and being displaced and da 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 like that's what happens and <laughs> that that happens because of the context. Like when you're in an art space, you're encouraged to think about things differently and think about things as art as such. Um, and the, like I said, the intellectual connotation of the designer's like work leads people to believe that, um, oh yeah, that they've applied like some degree of um, aesthetic theory to what they've done. And so people can even give it more meaning, like I said, and elevate it. And that's co completely connect to, connected to how we interpret nostalgia. <laughs> it's connected to Ingrid Loeschek's theory of fashion being a self-referential system of operative closure. So fashion is like this, autopoiesis where it like readjusts its internal organization based on what fashion is and what the fashion system is and it's like how American Apparel is like vertically integrated it's like the fashion system updates and changes itself within its own system and everything within fashion refers to other aspects of fashion which is how it's directly connected to Margiela when I get there it's all gonna make sense so every communication refers to a previous communication within the same system while Sam is simultaneously offering an opportunity to connect with a further fashion system communication. It's like when you see um, those fashion designers where they'll put like, make a bunch of jackets into a pair of pants. The only reason why that has meaning is because we know what jackets are. It works and then when things shift in, in fashion, that's how fashion is interpreted. I know it sounds like, okay, have a, like a TikTok or a video somewhere where I was like, that's why it's important to have distinctions between ourselves because how do you know you're not me? And the only reason you're not me is because you're you, but you're you because you're not me. Like, <laughs> I know it sounds stupid, but it's literally true because if you weren't you, you could be anything. You could be the wall. Why are you not the wall? Because you're not the wall. And the wall is not you. Why? Because it's not. You know what I mean? Period. And then, like, through what she says, like, symbi symbiotic mechanisms, fashion refers to the body through forms of clothing. Like, that's how meaning is derived. I had another quote, but I couldn't find it in any of my notes, but it talks about how, like, the only meaning that clothes have is based on their relationship with the body. Like that's where the meaning comes from. How far is it away from the body? What does it do to obstruct the body? What does it do to lengthen or shorten the body? Like that's the different like difficult thing about interpreting fashion versus other forms of art. The only meaning it has, like even if it's completely like extended off of the body, that's the meaning that it's extended off the body. I'm getting to the point where at Margiela, <laughs> okay. So how I think that this connects to Margiela is, and like I, there's no way I can do a comprehensive expl explanation of this with 20 to 40 minutes, but Margiela works with memory and nostalgia in so many unconventional ways. Um, the House of Margiela um, defies conventions of design and production and fashion, and they opt to rework designs from the house's past collections, and they reinvent uh, vintage pieces. The House of Margiela is seated in an interesting position relative to this conversation. It's a fashion house that has the same strength in defiance as all subcultures, questioning the mainstream authority, asking, how can clothes be made? Considering their artisanal work and constructing garments out of plates, broken glass, crystals from chandeliers, leather gloves, other already constructed clothes, they expose the process of commercialism in the fashion industry and generally just have an uncommon approach to fashion compared to the mainstream of fashion. It's much like 
uh, alternative music subcultures, which question how can music sound to challenge the mainstream. And it derives its strength from actively challenging complacency within that status quo. So the strength in challenging power unites people to long for a perception of the past that is certain and sure of strength and identity and outcome rather than ambiguity that they're experiencing presently. Though the past isn't perfect or as uncomplicated as it's been constructed to be, especially as is compared to the present, Paris Hilton, Snooki, Lindsay Lohan, for example. But the house of Margiela is subject to the same construction of artificial nostalgia itself. The strength of the house's work is acknowledged widely today. Some of the most virally circulated fashion images online are 1990s Margiela. People celebrate and long for a better time in fashion, a dream of returning to the anti-fashion culture that we've had in the past. The complex discourse circulates every day about the meaning of anti-fashion in that time period. But the house wasn't met with universal understanding upon its arrival in the fashion industry, though it was lauded by fringe fashion appreciators and buyers alike as challenging and important. His work was also misunderstood, much like Snooki. And outside of his work, the 90s and early 2000s were difficult times for fashion, politics, identity, and any form of existence, actually, rather than the utopian visions that they've been made out to be now. Margiela's work is important, but it doesn't indicate a better time in fashion at all, actually. It points to maybe the opposite, and I think that that should be clear. His work was received as so challenging to the existing fashion system at the time and worked to display the commercialism and its relationship with art and creative fashion. So maybe the house's work points to a worse time in fashion and a genius who thought to investigate it rather than a better time in fashion. Coincidentally and cleverly, I would say that Mason Margiela, especially their artisanal work, work to blend the meaning of the process of constructing clothes, the experience of interpreting clothes, and the outcome of producing those clothes, synthesizing the symbolic meanings at once. The work invites the viewer to reconcile all aspects of the past, present, and future of clothing and fashion itself simultaneously, and I think that that's where the brand derives its strength and longevity. The work poses the questions that are still relevant today about fashion. It combines the strength of defiance, similar to any subculture, the nostalgia of doll making and the process of being enchanted by making clothes, and the still relevant critiques on the fashion system with such ingenuity that it has resonance today, but is still challenging compared to most of today's work. So it creates a clever cycle of nostalgia itself. So it is the self-reflective practice of fashion in its nature. It's self-reflective, and it's just like the fashion system, even though it exists to critique the fashion system, because it's self-referential. The House of Margiela defying conventions of dressmaking is the house refusing to accept the present as a fashion house, rejecting the role of the dressmaker entirely, defying the conventions of the fashion industry. But I think that it's connected to nostalgia in that it's like saying, <laughs> When I, like when Marcello was younger, he was obsessed with dolls and doll making and dressing women and dressing these ideas and constructs of women. And a doll is not a real woman, by the way, if anybody didn't know. A doll is not a real woman, right? It's like a figment of a woman. It's a false reality. It's a false construction of a woman. And so he's a little kid also. He doesn't actually work in the fashion industry, but he always wanted to. And I think the obsession with doll making, the obsession with dolls on the runway, the obsession with dress making, the dress form, symbols, etc., etc., this is nostalgia he's thinking about, and the fashion house themselves, like all the people working, they're thinking about what it's like to grow up and want to be designers, and they're forcing us to think about that, versus working in the fashion industry and seeing that it's not like that to produce clothes, and that the fashion industry as a system is something that they want to critique using these clothes, based on like this idea that like when you were younger you thought it would be perfect to be a designer and blah 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 but when you actually end up doing it it's not the same thing so you're always longing for not only the process of constructing clothes which is also different than the outcome of making clothes and like having a finished product but also especially selling it within the fashion industry but you're longing for the time where you longed to be a designer so you're longing for the longing period and I think it's just all completely connected. I also think that someone's affinity with dolls can point to them longing for the time when they were children rather than their actual connection to dolls. Not that dolls don't slay. I am an adult who talks about digital doll making still to this day, 
that I did in early like elementary school. And I think that it has value to me, but I think that the larger value and purpose that it serves is to remember a time in my life where things were less chaotic, supposedly, and easier, supposedly, which was my childhood. Um, and so it is a, not only an attachment to the longing when you're a child to be a designer and imagining a false future, uh, that it's going to be this easy resolvable experience that will fix all the problems that you feel that you have at that present moment. But it's also a longing as an adult for the past and the time where you imagined what your future would be rather than being a part of it and the supposed stillness of childhood. But this is the connection to commodities as a resolution as well, because it is the simultaneous longing for a different period when you're in your childhood and escaping through playing with dolls, for example, or playing online with doll makers as I did, for example, and then growing up to be an adult and longing for that time back and missing that time, even though you spent that time to is trying to escape your present um, and possibly even capitalizing on nostalgia then. Um, you still long for the past once you move into the future because it is still a more certain time than the present. It is this simultaneous experience of past, present, and future that people long for and the supposed uh, resolution that childhood would give you. And again, it goes back to the idea of a false longing because who knows how any of our childhoods actually were if looked at objectively and not through the lens of nostalgia and it being a more certain time where we know the outcome of what happened during that period. Maybe our childhoods were even more chaotic than we remember or are able to process. But I do think a lot of people miss like these aspects of their childhood. Like I mentioned when I went back and watched the nostalgic quote unquote cartoons and had a really hard time doing it now. We think that this, this thing that's so central to our lives, like doll making on the internet or my obsession with the internet in general, that's what makes us who we are. And we just really appreciate that thing. But maybe it was a form of escaping the present in a way that is no different than experiencing nostalgia <laughs> tell me if it's not <laughs> um okay so da, 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 da. constantly so they're constantly revisiting the shape of the dress form which clothing is draped on in order to construct patterns and garments so the dress form is like those like model bodies that you i think there's one behind the door but i don't think i can open my door with this thing on it but i probably will have a picture of my own but a dress form is just like what you use to construct clothing you drape muslin fabric over it you cut the fabric on it and you can use tape and other forms of measurements to construct clothes it's like the the I don't want to say the formative process but like it's one way of making clothes um, is pattern making through draping on a dress form it's how you start the process of making clothes so it's an act of resisting the present and investigating the house's relationship with memory to always go back to the start of making clothes. It's like, why this emphasis on starting to make clothes? Why the emphasis on the process of making clothes? I think it's because of nostalgia. I think it's this idea that like before you actually finish something and once something's actually made, that's a very different feeling than when you have this excitement about wanting to design something and construct something and having someone in mind when you're making something. Very different than when you're like 12 or three or six, 10 years old, and you're like, I want to be a fashion designer. You're seeing the glory, the glamour. It, to me, I say it platforms a longing for the past because of it's, the, it's emphasizing the enchantment of learning how to make clothes and even become a designer. So you also have to start with the dress form to learn how to construct garment. So you find out that it's much more difficult once you become a designer and you have to start putting things into production and you're not just thinking about what do I want to make and how do I want to dress, quote unquote, my girl. You're thinking about satisfying investors, making sure that people who work under you get paid, finance for the business, thinking about the secretaries or administrators who work in the office. You're thinking about all those people's livelihoods and their families that they have to maintain based on how well you can sell a garment. And that makes it a very different thing. And that, again, creates this uh, ambiguity about the present and the future that people want to detach from. And I think the House of Margiela wants to detach from and instead go back to and emphasize the past or even like the imaginations of the past, the longing for the longing within the past, etc. So they stay focused on the process of making clothes versus the outcome in garment making. The finished product becomes an exercise of investigating memory as well in this case. Um, so they're reproducing, this goes to the part about um, Reproducing works from the House of Margiela, but also the vintage reworks. So moving into that, they reproduce works from the Maison's archive, which puts an emphasis on memory as well. And it's an act of cultural resistance 
to the fashion industry's ever-changing whims and the garments and runway shows in entirety act work to counteract the emphasis on novelty and tightening time span of the inherent obsolescence of the garments. So even to this day, like Margiela is one of the foremost reposted fashion designers, meaning that people are still revisiting his early work, meaning that it acts to resist the quick pace of the changing fashion industry now, even though it was doing that in the 90s, 2000s, etc. Something from the early 90s can still have resonance today to say like we're still going back to the past actually and it's like this um, resounding deflection, this resounding uh, defiance. 1991, we defy the fashion industry's fast pace. 1992, we defy it. 93, and they keep defying it when people um, see the value in those um, those works. Um, so it slows fas fashion down 20 plus years later. It's, it does an incredible feat to do that. So when they use this, they're allowing the audience to derive meaning from the memories of garments past. The only meaning that's constructed around the context the only meaning is constructed around context where you've seen clothes before. So when you see clothes printed on clothes, you only like derive meaning from that because you've seen clothes before. It seems stupid, but like that's what I was saying earlier about like the, the symbols that are created through this uh, way of interpreting clothing and fashion and everything. Like if you have a pair of pants sewn onto another pair of pants, but you can't actually put your legs through the pair of pants, I think that that's another way of challenging like the fashion industry at large um, and the conventions of dressmaking and also like learning how to make clothes <clears throat> in the first place. So I think that's also connected to nostalgia. What I said was in, in reading about the, the 20 year exhibition, like the retrospective, which I've been reading about, in looking at the exhibition, they use mirrors all around it. They reflect back to you what you think about clothes making. In my opinion, that's my opinion, in my opinion. I think having mir mirrors is not just to think about you, um, and not even just you and your relationship with the brand, but you and your relationship with clothes making in general. And I think that that uh, use of reflection is connected to nostalgia. Like I said, you're reflecting on the past, reflecting on your perspective on clothes making before you became a dressmaker, re reflecting on, you know, your interpretation of the fashion industry before you entered it. You're reflecting on your ability to construct, <coughs> what? conceive a garment versus constructing it and finishing it and producing it etc etc but also like you as a viewer so you're playing with uh illusion versus reality and i think nostalgia is illusion and i think the present is reality i think that you can technically miss the past but i think the the longing that we are encouraged to have especially with all of the marketing i don't think that you can ever truly remember the past accurately because we've seen commercials for different soda brands because we hear music that is marketed to us and that's how we shape our realities i don't think you can truly and I, even before this i'm sure like before they ever had like record labels i just don't think you can accurately remember the past especially when they do so much marketing around those things it does feel good to remember drinking xyz brand of soda in the 90s so, and, and I've seen a million commercials for XYZ soda from the 90s into the 2000s, into the 2020s. I can never delete that from my mind or the positive experiences that they've created or the, you know, maybe they've thrown events that I've gone to as well, or maybe they're associated with celebrities that I like as well. You can't eliminate that from your perspective on the past. So when you're remembering yourself drinking an ice cold soda from XYZ brand in the 1990s, it is like the nostalgia trap because it's not real. Like even if you have positive experiences that they really did create, they created those around marketing to you and have done that your whole life. Like there's no way to accurately depict the past in your um, memory, in my opinion. I think it's all connected to what I was saying earlier about how we use opting into certain products to create resolution for ourselves and certainty and satisfy the pathology of nostalgia, um, like the algae part about it, we're using opting into these certain products to satisfy that. And these products are being marketed to us in some instances, especially like think soda brands, um, by creating the false longing themselves. I think opting in and building that relationship can kind of obscure your memories of reality and also your experiences of reality in the present because of these associations that you make positively with um, marketing. Um, and also, again, back to the illusion versus reality, the House of Margiela uses all of these conventions of design to put on like Front Street 
the business aspect, I think, of clothes making, commercialism. You're taking a look at like the impact of commercializing design and being encouraged to investigate it and what it all means. And I think that that's the illusion versus reality, the nostalgia trap of it all. That maybe it's not what you thought it would be when you were just a little cheetah girl, cheetah sister. Um, okay. So yeah, I kind of talked about, I broke it down into like vintage garments, but I've already talked about it. You're reusing vintage garments in your designs, meaning you're encouraging people to interpret it based on the symbols that we've seen in the past. So when you have a deconstructed jacket that you're having a model wear backwards, the meaning is we know what a jacket is. We know how jackets are typically worn. We know what it means when it's being reconceived and being worn backwards. And that's where the meaning is created. But it's also a reference to something that we know and are sure of. It like str strengthens the meaning when you see it in a nostalgic perspective because it's just like other forms of subversive dressing. To have a Margiela runway where somebody's wearing a backwards tied jacket in the 90s, you're like, this is the Snooki of Margiela. You're certain that this is what you want to do. This is the black fashion of Margiela. You're certain that you want to defy the conventions that come from the hegemonic powers and say that I want to do something completely different and people cling to that for that reason. And what else? Da, 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 da. Deconstruction. I think the emphasis on deconstruction as well at the House of Margiela is directly connected to this. The the temporal nature, the process of like constructing things, um, memory, all of those things are being emphasized when you're showing the deconstruction of clothing. You're showing like this is how it's built, step one, step two, step three, and also encouraging people to investigate and how it relates to how we get dressed. Jesus Christ this is my longest video ever. Okay. I don't, I don't think it needs explaining, but again, the white paint, like how they white paint the garments, they white paint the entire office, they white paint the shoes, they, you know, they do that to show wear, and it's like, again, <laughs> the point of wear, and seeing like footmarks and like footprints and dirt all over the runway, and then reusing that runway in another context, and having people make footprints in the office, and having these white floors and white products, and everything is blanched out and white. It shows you like the history of something, but I think it's interesting because in that case, I think you can kind of like distort the history, but I think it's more concrete. Like these are not just symbols of the history. These are like physical representations of what has happened, but also you can like make that up and have people step in a way that they didn't actually step and then walk backwards and erase it just like in um, The Shining. So I think that that's interesting. And then the replica line, like think about the fragrance line is literally called replica to replicate times in the past. Like he is truly, or the fashion house truly is trying to capture the essence of the past and bottle it and sell it, which is interesting, um, and make it accessible to people to, um, to think about. Okay, interestingly enough, uh, I don't feel like I've said enough. I'm just joking. The video's over now. That's all I wanted to say. That's all I wanted to say. I was just thinking of how every single time I think of Martin Margiela, I think of Snooki. I think that they are kindred spirits. I think that they should connect to each other and... Yeah, like this is just all connected to me. And it's all thanks to that one person who didn't know that Paris Hilton, Lindsay Lohan, Snooki, also those are all different eras themselves. But, um, and um, Jersey Shore, we're not Y2K. It's literally just a random comment on someone's video encouraged me to write a 15 page paper. It's only like five pages though, in the regular font, uh, about it and talk for I think two hours before I have to get ready for my friend's birthday. Cheers. Cheers, as much as I want to have like a big bang ending, I just think the, the main concept is like we, we cling to the past because we, we cling to a false Im imagination of the past because times are really hard right now and sometimes things aren't what they seem but I also love investigating that and I don't think it's something you have to get super bogged down by, that things aren't what they seem or weren't how they, you remember them and I think it's kind of funny to have false memories of the past as more beautiful than they were. Probably not, if there is I'll just edit it in, thanks.